Welcome to our review of the retail version of Gorinto, plus the five player expansion and Kickstarter extras. Thank you, Grand Gamers Guild, for sending us a Kickstarter copy of Gorinto as a thanks for our Gorinto Kickstarter preview. Now, Gorinto was designed by Richard Yanner and features artwork by Josh Capel. It was published last year by Grand Gamers Guild here in North America after a rather successful Kickstarter. Now, Gorinto plays one to four players, four or five with the expansion, with games taking about an hour max. Now, Gorinto has a manufactured suggested retail price of $49.99 US, which honestly is quite good for the amount of plastic you get in this box. The fifth player expansion is just under $10, and the Kickstarter Extra set, which includes the Dragon Tiles mini expansion, is just under nine bucks. Now, both of these add-ons can only be picked up directly from Grand Gamers Guild. You won't be able to find them on your usual online stores or unfortunately at your FLGS. But wait, there's more. We have a special bonus for you. For the entire month of May 2022, if yes. you head over to Grand Gamers Guild and use the code bellhop, all one word, you can get the Kickstarter version of Garinto along with the fifth player expansion for only $44.99. Unfortunately, this offer is only valid in the US. Sorry, fellow Canadians. Now, some of you may be thinking, didn't you guys already review Garinto before? And you would be right, sort of. Now, this is our first time reviewing the final production version of Garinto and its expansion content. Back in February of 2020, when the Garinto Kickstarter was still going strong, we did release a preview, a prototype review of Garinto, and while many elements of the game are unchanged, we thought there was enough to talk about to warrant a follow-up review. Yeah, I really want to highlight a couple things that weren't in our original copy or have been upgraded. And I want to talk about the Dragon Tiles, the five-player expansion, and some rule variants, as well as the solo mode, which didn't exist in our preview. And then there's, of course, the fact that I want to talk about Garinto because we're the unofficial ambassadors of Garinto because we're constantly trying to get more people to try this great game, and I just love talking about it. Now, once again, we have received review copies of this game, but I personally gave money on Kickstarter because I believed in it. We're not paid for this. We just really have loved this game that much. Yeah, actually, we didn't. We received prototypes of this game. Now, for those of you learning about this game for the first time, Garinto is an abstract tile drafting game where players are trying to build their knowledge of the five elements by selecting tiles from the path and moving them onto the mountain. You then remove tiles based on the element of the tile you placed and your existing knowledge of that element. Now, all of this is being done to score points based on your growing knowledge levels and randomized scoring cards. To get a look at the very well-made components in Garinto, Check out our unboxing video on YouTube. Now, note that this unboxing video does feature the Kickstarter version of the game, so a couple of the components have been upgraded. The round marker is thick plastic, the first player marker is metal, and we do have the dragon tiles. And I also have the five-player expansion, so that's in the box as well. Note, you can purchase a Kickstarter upgrade kit directly from Grand Gamers Guild, but you can't just buy the Kickstarter version on its own. Yeah, and that upgrade kit is only available through Grand Gamers Guild. While you can find the base game and at your usual online game stores, friendly local game stores, but I honestly still have not seen anywhere selling the upgrade kit. And the same goes for the five player expansion. It seems like you can only get the base game unless you go direct to the source. Now, getting back to component quality, it's great. Uh, the highlight being the various element tiles. Uh, these are plastic, like they remind me of the board game Upwards, if you've ever played that, a Scrabble variant. They stack together really nice, they're bright colored, they include symbols on them in case color combinations are problematic for people with vision issues. All the cardboard is nice and thick, everything's well punched, the cards are in good quality, and you get a multitude of languages in the box. The so only one actually matter for us, but it's nice to have all of the various gold cards in multiple languages. While there is part of me that wishes, like upwards, you got a nice little plastic tray to stack things on, I fully understand that can't be done at the $50 price point. Now, that being said, it's not perfect, and later we'll get to some of the less than perfect parts of it that we're hoping sees its way to a second printing to fix. But for now, let's move on to an overview of play. So the first thing you do in a game of Garinto is build what you call the mountain. This is a 5x5 grid of tiles that are placed on the main board. 
Now, the standard mountain pattern is a stack of four tiles in the middle, surrounded by a stack of three tiles, surrounded by a stack of two tiles. Now, the rule book also includes other patterns you can try out, including a wave and a depression. Now, everyone selects a player power, takes a player board in that color, and places their scoring marker on zero. Next, scoring cards are randomized. There's two different types of these. You have key element cards, which is one for each of the five different elements in the game. You're going to shuffle it and put two face up on the board. Then you're going to draw two goal cards. There are way more of these. I didn't count how many, sorry. You're going to shuffle those and put those into play. Now, these tell you what you're going to score during the game with the key element cards giving you points at the end of the game. And it's all based on how many tiles you have of that element. And the goal scoring cards, which you're going to score every season, each round of the game. Now, these include all kinds of things like scoring your highest stack of tiles or scoring your lowest stack twice or scoring only your even stacks or scoring your middle stack or getting three points for having the lowest in each color and so on. So this is really kind of the magic sauce of Garinto, mm -hmm. that randomized scoring message each game really kind of, of kind of pulls all the concepts together and makes it work as a game that you just want to keep playing. Now, once everyone read and understands the scoring cards, go through them multiple times. That's my pro tip. Make sure everyone knows what you're going to score at the game. You, you then start playing. Now, each round starts by filling the path. This is an area around the mountain that's going to hold 10 random tiles. Now, these tiles go at the end of each row and each column. Now, each turn, each player is going to select one of those tiles in the path and move it onto the mountain, placing it on one of the stacks in the same row or column the tile came from. They then draw tiles off the mountain based on what element they used, with each element having its own unique pattern. Void has you take tiles diagonally adjacent to where you played. Wind has you select orthogonally adjacent. Fire has you take tiles in the same row, whereas water has you taking from the same column. Actually, I think I got those back. Fire's this way, water's that way, because fire fires up and water flows left to right. Earth lets you take tiles from under the tile you placed. Now, it sounds a bit daunting to hear it this way, but as soon as you sit down in front of the board, it's mm -hmm. a really quite straightforward mechanic, even if it leads to gameplay, but it's hardly simple. And this is one, while I was working on writing this, I said to Deanna, I'm like, this is way too hard to describe when it's not there. When people are there, it's simple. I just pick up a fire, I put it, and I go, you get these. If you pick up this, you do this. And I will note that the mountain board does have a graphical reference right there for people who do forget. It's very clear and graphical, not text. So like you don't have to read anything and just look at it. Now, the number of tiles you're going to draft. So you're moving your tile from the path to the mountain. What, the number you get to draw is based on your existing knowledge in that element plus one. So a max of four tiles for all elements but Earth. Now, knowledge, we keep mentioning your knowledge. Well, your knowledge is the number of tiles you already have in that element. So my knowledge in fire, if I've collected two fire tiles already, means my knowledge is two, and when I'm drawing, I get my knowledge plus one, so I get to draw three tiles when I play a fire. So that makes sense, I hope. Now, all tiles drafted are, of course, placed on your player board, which increases your knowledge. So every round, you're going to get new tiles, and your knowledge is going to go up. And this is part of the gotcha mechanics, is the more you collect, the more you have to take the next time, and you might not want nope. as many as you're going to have to take based on your knowledge. Yeah, it totally depends on the scoring cards that are out. Some games, you just want to collect all you want, but most, you're trying to get evens or odds or you're going to score your lowest and your highest, so you're trying to get a balance, which is part of the brilliance of the game. Now, the game continues until there are less tiles left on the path than the number of players. Pretty simple, right? This triggers the end of the round. Any remaining tiles on the path are removed from the game. All players score those two goal cards. Start player token is passed to the right, and the game continues. Now, a game is played for a total of four full rounds. At the end of the final round, everyone scores those key element cards, which are worth two points for every tile you've collected in those colors. Player with the most points wins. And four rounds actually in, is four seasons or one year in this case. Yes. Yep. So, and all of that is played on, under an hour, depending on, depending on player count and, and setup and, and teach and such like that. But even AP, a pretty bad, this game can have pretty bad AP, but it doesn't tend to push it past that hour mark. Now, I will admit with the five-player expansion, things do get a little longer. Now, with only two players, there's, of course, a special set of rules, but honestly, they're not that bad in this one. All it is is that after you take your turn, another tile is going to be removed from the path. Now, there are two ways to do this. The default is to use the burrow tokens, where it's randomly going to determine which goes off, or you can do it through player choice. 
Nope, that's totally new. When we played the prototype, it was always player choice. So it's kind of cool that there's a borough token to make things simpler where it's just random. So I do dig that because that didn't exist originally. Now, Garinto also comes with solo rules where you're going to play against Kitsune, who is a fox spirit. In general, you play the game as normal for you. Like you take your turns normal, you play everything the same. Now, after each of your turns, there's this system of tiles and tokens that tells you which tiles Kitsune takes, which is always a minimum of four because Kitsune is a spirit and she has unlimited knowledge of all five elements. Now, your score is going to be based on those key elements and goals. Kitsune, though, is just collecting as many tiles as they can and is going to score the two regular key elements as well as two other random elements at the end of the game. Note, Kitsune does not score goals at all. With the added solo and the purchasable five-player expansion, this game really does hit a lot of groups' needs. Mm -hmm. And unlike some games, is fun and challenging playing at these various player counts. These aren't just thrown on the box to sell more copies to more groups. Yeah, we've often complained about games having player counts in the box that really don't fit the gameplay, and that is not the case here. Now, Sean mentioned... Um, various player counts there's also some variant rules there's other things to change it up so one of the ones rules one of my favorites that i actually use every time i play is what's called compassionate turn order this throws a, a catch-up mechanic in the game what it does is it has players going in the order of lowest score to highest score instead of just going clockwise from the start player and there's a nice set of the one through five tokens to track that just so you don't forget now there's also a partnership mode which is fascinating because it's a two on two team version of play where the goal cards are shared by adjacent players. So you actually put them between you. So me and this opponent are sharing this goal and me and that opponent are sharing that goal. That's neat. But then there's this added bonus. Whenever you draft any tiles, you have to give one to your partner. And again, sometimes you don't want tiles. And that's all just in case the five different basic player variation groups weren't enough. Yes. Now, my favorite variant in Garinto, and this is another one that was new at the retail copy, and this to me was almost worth the price of admission, is the Seasons of Change. When using this optional rule, you place out four goal cards instead of two, but only two are in play. And they rotate each at the end of each season so that you're only using two each season and they're going to roll in. This is my preferred way to play Garinto, and I recommend throwing this in as soon as you can. Maybe play one game without it just so everyone gets on the same page, but toss that in there as quick as you can. But what is it that makes this variant stick out for you? All right. So having rotating goals really ups the long-term strategy. of the game. So in the base game, for all four seasons, you're trying to build your knowledge towards the same two goals for the entire game. So season one and season four are scoring the exact same thing. And all players are doing this. So this often means what you're trying to do each round honestly stays somewhat static. I wouldn't go so far as to say stale. But like if you're trying to build a huge collection of one tile or you're trying to keep everything even for the whole game or you're trying to make sure you're the lowest in a couple elements. Well, with seasons of change, what you score changes every season. Every season, two cards are in play. And since they're four seasons, the cards are going to rotate each round. It actually means that each scoring card is going to be in play twice. But every time it's in play, it's with a different pair, which I thought was fascinating. This leads to a lot more having to plan ahead and more variation and adaptability required to play well. All right, well, now with your copy of the game, you also got some expansion content. How about you highlight what each of these does, starting with the five-player expansion? All right, it's, it's simple. It lets you play with five players. Like, honestly, that's pretty much it. Now, the big change is that you do add five more of each element tile to the game. These are randomized in the bag with the rest of the tiles at the beginning of the game. And when you're building the mountain, you just stack everything one higher. So with the basic setup, you're going 5-4-3 instead of 4-3-2. Gameplay-wise, having five players, all that actually means is that every single tile will be taken from the path and none are removed from play. So you will get to the point where the last player in turn order is going to be forced to play what's up, which is a, a slight change in tone, I guess you would say. So simple enough. How about the dragon tiles and the other Kickstarter upgrades? Okay, so the upgrades, there's not a lot. Like, you know how some Kickstarters, you get a ridiculous amount of upgraded components? These are pretty basic, but they're cool. You get a 3D solid plastic Gorento for the round marker instead of a cardboard standee, and the first player tokens metal. That's your upgrades. Now, what you do get is five dragon tiles, and this is what I think is worth the price of entry. Now, to use the dragon tiles, you again just toss them in the bag at the start of the game. And then, when you're putting out the mountain, they could come up. 
or when filling out the path, they could come up in either place. So when picking a dragon from the path and you're putting it on the mountain, you get to decide what element that is that turn. So you could use it as fire, water, and your existing knowledge, it plays off that. Now, once it's on the mountain, you don't have to remember what it was. It doesn't matter anymore. Now, when you take it off the mountain, similarly, it's a wild card. You put it in whatever knowledge slot on your personal player board you want. So a great way to, you know, even off a set you want even or to get you one tile in a color you didn't have before. Now, one interesting effect of using these, though, is it does remove one bit of perfect information from the game. In Garinto, normally every tile comes out of the bag every game. With this, five are going to be left in the bag that never enter play. Now, if you don't like this, this isn't an official variant, but a house rule of my own is take out one of each color, and then you still keep that perfect balance. But honestly, the variation of five tiles isn't going to hurt much. Well, now that we know how to play Garinto, its variants and expansion, it times to, it's time to talk about why we love this game so much. Yes, unlike our usual reviews, and now you'll find out what we think. You know what we think. If you pay attention to us on social media, we talk about Garinto all the time. This is a fantastic game. This is a game that I have enjoyed since sitting down at the Tallulah Cafe with Deanna and bringing it out for the first time with the prototype copy with the little plastic disc with the stickers on it. Uh, this is just great. And I am happy to say that the production version has everything I loved about that, but more. So, uh, indeed, the additional variant forms and dragon tiles really were nothing but a boost to an already fun game. Yeah, overall, the game plays engaging, both tactical and strategic, but dead simple to learn and teach. You literally are just taking a tile from one spot, put it in another, and grabbing up the four tiles. This is one of those games that I honestly think earned the term in elegant. I know people like to toss around, that's an elegant game, this is an elegant game. No, this really is an elegant game. And I played this game with hardcore heavy gamers. I played it with kids. I played it with non-gamers. And all of them have enjoyed the game. And honestly, I'm sure they're out there. I'm not trying to say you don't exist, but I have yet to teach Corinto to someone that did not enjoy it. I'm sure there's people out there that don't love it as much as we do, but I haven't met them myself. And teaching is a bit of an exaggeration. It's really not tough to pick up at all. Though different variations, of course, do require differing knowledge to greater or lesser degrees. Well, this is one of those games where learning to play is easy. Learning to play well is something totally different. Now, things I appreciate being in this now production copy, right, since we first got to play, include the improved tiles, which honestly, I'd love to touch the feel, uh, the better looking player boards, the added variety in goal cards, as well as some of the new additions. Like I do like the new two player rules I already mentioned about the burrowing. That's pretty cool. And the whole Kitsune thing didn't even exist when I played this. I got to say that's amazing. I really, it's, it's interesting. You're putting out like the head of the fox and the tail of the fox. Like it, it's not just to flip a card and find out what Kitsune did. There's, it's a little bit more involved. I didn't want to get into full details. Um, and then of course, the, the Seasons of Change variant. Now the Seasons of Change variant, I praise so much that the designer Mark is, or sorry, not the designer, the publisher is strongly suggesting making that the default way of play. I strongly recommend everyone use Seasons of Change from your second game on. So quite the ringing recommendation there, but let's not pretend it's perfect. Yeah, despite how much we love this game, it's not all roses. This is not perfect. There are some minor issues here I do want to call out. And the first, which is the most glaring, is the fact that the rule card for the five-player expansion doesn't actually tell you what to do with the additional tiles that come with it. So the first time we played, we're like, I don't know, we just tossed them in the bag. And all that did was mess up the distribution of the tiles. Like we had way too much fire out that game. And then the last couple rounds of the game, our mountain was like almost empty. We're like, like it wasn't empty. There was stuff to grab, but like your last round, you're not grabbing four tiles. You're lucky if you get two or three. Now for our second game, we're like, well, because the mountain ran out and we got lots of extra tiles, why don't we try putting extra tiles out on the mountain right at the start of the game? And while well, that played out much smoother, and it turns out that's the way the designer intended it to be played. And while well, I already explained that during the rule teach anyway. However, we only figured this out that it was official by asking around online. Now, I do know this rule misprint is something on the list to be fixed if they ever have to do a second printing of the expansion. A minor yet rather important detail. As we point out, not everyone who gets games has the knowledge or ability to figure out how to contact the publisher to get answers or dig through forums on BoardGameGeek. 
And I will shout out something that uh, is Mark Spector at Grand Gamers Guild. He's the, the owner of Grand Gamers Guild. He's been fantastic uh, through our entire Corinthia experience. Like, he has been there to answer every question I've ever had, as well as doing some awesome, cool stuff that not every publisher does, like retweeting our content and, you know, thumbsing up anytime we talk about Corintho. So next complaint is the scoring track. And I know I, it's a problem in many games. It's a minor thing. And you can keep score however you want. We could use poker chips. We could write it down. But I hate the scoring track in this game. It's just not long enough. It goes around the, the board, and it only goes up to 50. And the standees for your player thing, like the follow-over, I, just, I, I don't like the score track. It just kind of bugs me. I don't know what i do better. But, like, it only goes to 50, and I don't think I've ever played a game of Garinto where s someone didn't get past at least 50. And I've had multiple games where they go past 150. And yes, there are little tiny cardboard stars in the player colors at plus 50 on one side and plus 100 that you're supposed to put somewhere. Like, I get it, but I just would have preferred some type of longer track. I don't know, maybe it needed to snake and then snake back around. I, I don't know where you put it, but it, it I just wish it was longer. This is a tough one. Scoring tracks are notoriously tricky to work out with available space without, you know, adding a whole other scoring section to the game, with, yeah. which costs more. You know what, though? This is more people need to do this. So if it gets bumped, it stinks. Give me two rows, one that says 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, and a bottom that says one through nine. Just do that. I just I need two scoring tokens for every player, but that's way less space than 50 individual items. Now, my final complaint, unfortunately, is about the plastic tiles. Well, I love them in many ways. I love how they feel. I like the sound they make in the bag. I like how thick they are. I love how much easier it is to look at the mountain and see what's on the bottom of a stack and easily look around to see what colors are there. So I know what I'm going to draft, but they're, they, they stack too well, but she didn't, wouldn't think this is a complaint, but it's a problem in three ways. So for one, they like to stick together. This is a pain in the bag and it makes pulling out one tile at a time actually difficult. You're like, you tend to grab stacks and, kind of doing together and putting it away stinks because when you're you're putting your stacks away they're all the same color and you want to split them off or else you might pull them out together but then they also stick together on the mountain so often you can't just grab your tile it takes two hands you got to go in and you got to hold the bottom and then you got to pop your tile off the top finally though and this is my biggest issue is they stack so well you can't tell how many are in a stack at a glance now, yes, when you're holding it up to your face, you can easily tell them apart. But when I'm looking across the table at, say, Sean's stack of things, trying to figure out, does he have the lowest orange or do I? I don't want to tip my hand and say, hey, Sean, how many fire tiles do you have? I want to be able to look at a glance and go, okay, I have the low lowest right now. But if he gets one more tile, we're good. And if I say, how many do you have? He's like, oh, wait, Mo's looking at fire tiles, right? It kind of spoils it. I just wish there was something like a ring around the bottom. Like I thought about taking a Sharpie to them or symbols or dots on the sides, maybe put the elements on the sides. I don't know, just something to make them easier to count at a glance. Now this is certainly easily solvable with a Sharpie, but we always prefer first party solutions where possible. Yeah, another suggestion that uh, Ryan Macklin, the Ryan Macklin of the internet uh, pointed out to me was um, a measuring stick. Like just a, a measuring stick you could do. But again, I don't know if that helps when looking across the table. Now, all these issues, honestly, are minor. Um, I know Mark from Grand Gamers Guild has already fixes in place for some of them. If we ever get to a second printing, this game needs a second printing. Code, bond, code, bellhop, go buy them so they can make better versions. I know. And then you're like, but then I'll have the old version. We need to sell this game so we can do another printing that fixes these problems. And it's not just us. While we have certainly been responsible for a number of others playing the game and buying the game, I don't think I've yet seen anyone disappointed that we nudge them to it. It's yeah. just a fun game. Yeah, overall, not only do we love Garinto, but pretty much everyone I've talked Garinto to has loved it as well. Uh, to me, this is the definition of a modern classic. This is a modern classic tile laying game that should be talked about in the same breaths as games like Sagrada and Azul. And honestly, in my opinion, a bit above both of those. Rento is easy to learn, difficult to master. Requires a lot of strategy to play well, but is dead simple to learn. Features near-perfect information, and winning means not only watching what you're doing, but keeping careful track of what everyone else is doing at the table as well. I think one of the major things holding it back from reaching the levels of Sagrada Azul is simply distribution and marketing budgets. Though, of course, the pandemic hasn't helped no. either. 
Uh, yeah, the timing here. There's certainly nothing about the game itself that sh- that would hold it back from being a uh, mass market hit. Big thing with this too is the physicality. This game would have shown so well at cons. The, the stacking tiles. Uh, it's bad timing. It happens. Uh, Garento is one of those rare games I honestly think almost every green group is going to enjoy and should get a copy of. I can almost recommend this universally. I do say almost, though, because there is groups of gamers out there that I don't think would be interested in this. You know, the the story gamers looking for an RPG and an epic experience. Ameritrash fans who love adventure games and dungeon crawls and high excitement levels and speedy play and simultaneous movement or lots and lots of dice and randomness. All those players aren't going to find any of that here. But if you enjoy abstract strategy games at all, you owe it to yourself to find a way to try Garanto. Like, I would actually go so far as to say you're probably safe to just pick it up. If you can't find a way to try before you're by, you're probably going to be perfectly fine picking it up. And if you don't like it, you'll probably be easily able to find someone else who will. Uh, currently, there are no legitimate versions of online play for Garanto, though we'll keep folks updated if that changes. Yeah, that would be odd. I would love to be able to play Garanto online. Now, as for the expansions, I've found them to be fully optional, honestly. Like, they're neat, but you don't need them. Um, now, if you have a green group that's five players all the time, pick up the five-player expansion. If your game group is four players, usually don't pick up the five-player expansion. Now, as for the dragons, I like them well enough. Uh, my kids really dig them. They like the wild card. Like, there's just something about playing a wild card they like. So I usually just don't take them out of my copy. I just leave my dragons mixed in with everything else. So if having something like in this game... It, like having wild card sounds fun to you that then adds that little no perfect information you may have a little bit less red than another color of that game because there's some stuck in the bag go for it also remember you can get both of those things all together kickstarter and everything with our limited time discount code that's right starting tonight and lasting the rest of may you can get the Kickstarter edition of Garinto and the fifth player expansion for only $44.99 when buying direct from Grand Gamers Guild and using the code BELLHOP, all caps, one word. Of course, we will throw a link to where you can get that directly and just purchase it, though you don't have to. You can go there on their own. You don't have to click our link, but I'll make it as easy as I can to get there. That's it for our review of Garinto, a modern classic we hope will become an evergreen as yeah. more and more gamers discover it. Now, what's a game you love that you wish more people would try? Tell us all about it in the comments below. And when you get a chance, I welcome you to also check out my written review over at tabletopbellhop.com, where I might add a little bit more information. There'll be a link to where you can get the game, and I'll have lots of pictures so you can see just how nice those tiles are. 